William Lindner. I'm a, uh, I'm a pivot here, and I've, I've been at Pivotal for about five months now, uh, and I currently work on Bosch core engineering downstairs. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, this talk is about why I left a successful startup that I co-founded to join Pivotal. So it's a little bit different in that it's not a technology, a specific technology, or it's not um, about a specific thing like that. It's more like a story, like about the, the experience that I had, uh, the experience that I went through, that I hope that you all can apply to your own lives when you're making decisions about where you want to work. Or, but of course, also, when we're consulting for startups, when we're helping startups, I, I think there's a lot of things that you might find that are parallels between things that they're going through uh, and, and what I went through. So starting out, um, I'll talk a little bit about what is Zoom Data. Just some background about what the company does, uh, what the product is, and then I'll go into what made me want to leave, uh, and then a, a little bit of time left for questions. So what is Zoom Data? Uh, it is, the elevator pitch is that it's real-time visual analytics for big data. Uh, that's a lot of buzzwords and stuff like that, so let's try to unpack it a little bit. Um, if I could sum it up, I'd probably say that it's charts for lots of data. Uh, big data, or Zoom data, will connect to many different big data sources. Uh, it will stream all that data, perform calculations on it, and then you get these charts and things like that um, in your web browser. So this is an actual screenshot of the product. Um, and you can tell it, it's really intended more for end users, not developers who know SQL uh, or something like that. It's more for people in a giant company. They've got tons and tons and tons of data. Maybe they can't transform it or move it. And this allows them to uh, get value out of it, report off of it in an easy to use way. Uh, we worked on tablets, uh, web browsers mainly, built a ton of charts, um, and I managed the front end engineering team uh, at Zoom Data. But that is not what my talk is about today, because my talk is more about why I left that company. Um, and the the quick answer is that I left mainly because I was frustrated, right? I didn't leave because I was so incredibly happy there or something like that. Um, but why was I frustrated? What led to that um, and what happened? So to go back to the beginning, when I, when I uh, joined Zoom Data, I, I, was, I knew I was at a point where I really wanted to uh, work for an early stage startup. I, I, um, you know, just being a software engineer, you, there, you get a lot of, you hear a lot of stories about that. I read a lot of Hacker News, um, and I read most of the Lean Startup. So I was basically qualified to be an entrepreneur, right? Um, so at that point, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know if I wanted to do it myself, but I was approached by the founder of Zoom Data, who I'd worked with at a previous company, um, that he had founded, and he, I, I joined that with him, and uh, a few other co-founders as well, and I was I was the first engineer uh, on the team. So a lot of uh, the a, a lot of the work that I signed up for was you know writing code, doing engineering work, things like that. Um, and from the beginning, I would say the overwhelming feeling that I had working uh, at this early stage startup was a feeling of uncertainty. Uh, this, this is very common when you work at early stage startups. And I put up a bunch of questions that were kind of like running through my head constantly when I was in this phase. There, there are things like, you know, will we get another round of funding? But it's also things like, do we have the right team? Is there going to be an open source project that's just going to come out and totally blow us out of the water? You know, uh, it's questions about whether you're an enterprise company or whether you're a consumer company. You're constantly in this state of uncertainty, um, and, and you're really unsure about what you're doing. But this is actually kind of the fun part of a startup, because you get to define those things yourself. You get to figure that out, hopefully, through talking to customers, um, 
using data and things like that so that you can, you can decide what kind of company you're creating. Um, and one example of this was when we started out, we weren't sure whether we were going to be an enterprise or a consumer type product. Uh, we started out only on iPads. Uh, it, it was more like a website that you would go to, upload some data, and then you get some charts, make it really easy to use. Um, and then over time, we morphed more into focusing on enterprise sales, which means that you know, you're really going to have to be on every single device and every single platform. This decision made a huge impact to the culture and the structure of our company. Um, it, it, it was one of those things that, that really shapes things down the line. You, you, you make this decision up front, and then um, it has all sorts of consequences uh, down the road as well. Um, okay, so uncertainty was kind of the first emotion that, that I really went through uh, when I was there. But then a lot of that uncertainty led to an incredible amount of rushing, okay? And what do I mean by this? Rushing is, is kind of working in the state of, of constantly trying to get things done faster. You're always, you're kind of pressured to take shortcuts. You're, you're in this phase where you're constantly switching context is what I found. So I, I, I did a lot of the engineering work. That's what I was there to do. But I was always switching between, uh, you know, at the early stages, I, I was doing implementations at the customer site. I was doing sales demos. I was making training videos and uh, all sorts of things that had nothing to do really with engineering. You're, you're at that phase, and this is really important for a startup to survive, but it's also really important for a startup to grow out of. There was never time to do the right thing. Uh, we, we almost never wrote tests. Uh, we didn't do anything like test-driven development. And that meant that we really hit a, a wall eventually, that you, know, you make a lot of progress, and then you, you hit this point where it's so difficult to maintain things. Um, and, and I think that, that's kind of what doing the right thing is about, where you take the time to refactor the code, you, uh, uh, you name things properly, all, all sorts of things that I think are a core element of how Pivotal works. Um, and what this, what this really led into was a lack of process uh, or a, a very rushed process. It was almost like our process was just rush, rush, rush. Uh, and so I'll get into a little bit of the process, but first I'll tell you about how the company was structured, a little background about that. Because from, from the very beginning of Zoom Data, we were remote. Uh, Zoom Data is remote meaning that we had offices all over the world. Uh, we had different people, uh, some working from home, some in an office. And that made it extremely difficult to communicate. We take this autonomous office approach where you say, you know, different offices can work independently of the other ones. What we had at Zoom Data was most of our engineers were in Kiev, Ukraine. And to give you an idea of how, how large the team was, by the time I left, we had about 50 engineers in Kiev, Ukraine, um, with some QA people, some PMs as well. And then we had our design practice in New York City. Uh, so if you think about that, we're already splitting up design and the engineering. You're, you're already going to have trouble communicating uh, with, with people that come from a different culture, but you're also adding all these time zones as well makes it really difficult to, to work in. And then we had some engineers that were in Virginia, and then I moved down to San Francisco about a year and a half ago to start the West Coast Engineering Office. So I was managing engineers that were in Kiev, Ukraine, working with designers that were in New York City, and all of this was, was very chaotic. It was really, really inefficient. Um, and I think one element of that is not having autonomous offices. But also, a big part of it was that our, our engineering process itself just could not deal with, with this type of, of structure as well. So this is an example of how our engineering process worked while I was there. 
Um, and this is the wrong way to do it, just to make that clear. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, what do you do? Uh, if we're talking about like a six-month release cycle or some, some new release that you want to do, what we would start by doing is we'd set a deadline. We need to get th this release out before this next conference or this customer really wants this by this date, something like that. Then we would start defining the work that would be done by that deadline. So we would take some ideas from, uh, from the different customers that we were talking to, different groups, different ideas that people had, and we'd make a ton of JIRA tickets, just hundreds and hundreds of JIRA tickets. And then we would actually estimate that work. So I was an engineering manager. We, the engineers that were in Kiev uh, would actually not be involved in the estimation of the work. Part of the reason was just because it was so difficult to get everybody into the same meeting at the same time because of all these time differences. But you start estimating the work, and I would notice that it, what you're really doing is you're trying to predict the future. You're saying that all of these things that we're doing, they're going to be done, all these hundreds of tickets, they're going to be done by this time, uh, and they're going to take this long, and you know, we've agreed to it. We've, we've made that prediction. But you're not even including the engineers that are doing the work um, in those estimations. So if you've ever worked at a company like this or, or been through this process, you probably see where this is going, right? By the, at the beginning of your, of, your, of your release cycle, you're kind of feeling like things are okay, but you're, you're, something in the back of your mind is thinking, ah, you know, I think something went slower in one of these other groups, and I think it's going to slow other things down. I'm not really sure. Uh, but, but you don't know. You just say, well, we've committed to it. We're doing it. We're, 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 we predicted the future. We know it's going to be fine. And then about halfway through, things just don't work out. Something came out, came, came up, some unexpected snag, some team that everyone else depended on was slowing down the, you know, something happened, right? Just the inevitable um, slowdown. And so what do you do? You apply more pressure to the team. You say, we need to start rushing. And what I was talking about before, when you're rushing, you're, it, it's important for startups to move quickly. But when you're rushing, you're not doing the best work that you can. And you're probably starting to do worse and worse work as you go. Um, it's, it's very bad to start applying those things to a team um, constantly. You, you have to have a little bit of balance there. And then, of course, uh, you get to the deadline. You, you've basically missed the deadline, but you just start cutting features. This isn't de-scoping features. This is just cutting things that aren't done yet. You haven't picked them out according to what you, what you want. Th these are you know, things that just haven't gotten finished yet. And then you get to your QA process, and you would, that's basically your feedback loop. That's when you start knowing whether the code that you were writing six months ago is even working, right? <laughs> um, and and that's, that, that was something that we really depended on uh, because we, we had such slow feedback cycles. Uh, we had a QA team, and we had a team that was doing bug fixing uh, full time. That's all they were doing all day, every day. So we would get new, new people onto the team. They would start working on bug fixing. And it would really, really, uh, it, it was really bad for morale. Nobody wants to be on that type of team. And this, this very long feedback cycle was, was just grueling. It, it just felt like you were always rushing. It felt like that part of, of, of rushing had been instilled in this process. And this, this type of rushing started to eventually lead to, I, well, I think really was rooted in a lot of confusion, and a lot of confusion about what, what we were doing as a company, how we were all aligned to a certain goal. Uh, from the, the very beginning of the company, our, our founder brought us together. We had a meeting, and he made it clear that he didn't want to impose culture on the company. He wanted it to happen organically. He wanted it to come out of the people who, 
who he had, had hired, which is an admiral, admirable thing to want, but I think that it's actually something that, can, that leads to a culture that just uh, becomes the, the, the worst parts of the, the past companies that people worked at. It's sort of like when you're not intentional about these things, they just sort of turn into uh, things like rushing or having this process, having people um, uh, not on the same page about what they're working towards. So culture's talked about in, in a lot of companies, and I think there's a lot of you know, uh, opinions about what it is. It's kind of a subjective thing, but the way that I think about it, and the thing that I think is really important is that culture, the way you can dis really tell whether something is about culture is usually if it's a trade-off, okay? So choosing one thing when you've got all these other options, or choosing one thing over another thing, over another option. So what do I mean by this? When we talked about that, and when our founder explained that he didn't want to impose culture, a lot of the examples that were used were things like, things like uh, company trips, or, or uh, happy hours, or, you know, things like that, which in reality are just perks. People are not really, you're, you're not really making a big trade-off when you decide to have, have these kinds of happy hours or have those types of, those perks. Um, and an, an, an example of this that I think kind of explains it a little better also is between the companies Facebook and Dropbox. So I don't know if Facebook has changed this internal mantra, but what they had for a long time was this idea of move fast and break things, okay? That's a trade-off. You are trading off quality for getting things out and scaling and getting every single person in the world to be a user of your product. Um, when it, but on the other hand, you have a company like Dropbox. I've got a friend that works there, and he told me that one thing that he hears a lot of is people talking about sweat the small stuff. That's about going deep on details, getting things right, making sure that you've spent the time to, to really do a good job. And if you think about the types of products that they're making, it really fits what they're doing. If you're doing automated backups and, and for consumers, you're gonna be, you, you don't wanna lose that data. You don't, you don't wanna lose their personal data or break something. You're gonna lose customers. And so these, both of these companies are really successful, but they have almost opposite cultures or ways of working. And so I think what's most important is actually to decide that for yourself. It's not about having some you know, fancy vision statement on the website. I think bigger companies do that eventually. But this is something you can do for free. You, you can, you know, startups have this opportunity to define this if, if they really are real about what they're trying to do and what they're trying to create. Okay, so those were, those were a lot of the, the, um, the different things that, that happened while I was at Zoom Data, kind of how the process worked, how it, uh, really how it broke down. And if you've worked at Pivotal for a little while, you might understand why it, it was such a drastic you know, 180 and such a better uh, kind of fit for, for what I was interested in because the, the development process that we had was so haphazard. Our founder would talk about, you know, bring together people from any background and, and, and just let them go with, with, you know, the tickets that you have and, and um, you know, they'll, they'll make progress on their own. But really it just became very chaotic. And I think that a rigorous development process means that you have a framework to work in and then you kind of have the freedom within that. You, you can make decisions for yourself. Uh, and and I, I think it's a much better way, and I've found it to be a much pr more productive way of working. But also co-locating uh, with, the, with the clients and also, of course, pair programming, um, it's, it, it really makes a huge difference. It drove me crazy to have a team of engineers 10 time zones away that... I didn't know what, you know, it, it was difficult to know what they were working on. It was difficult to get to know them and learn from them and 
uh, really collaborate with them, and you just feel very disconnected from, from uh, the company and what's going on. And also, what really encouraged me and um, what I really liked about Pivotal also was a culture of inclusion and diversity. I feel like this is a priority at the, at the top of the company. Um, and it's something that takes a lot of work, and it takes work from all of us. It's not something that can just be you know, imposed on us uh, from on high. But I want to invest my time in companies that are, are willing to take these, these um, willing to make these decisions and do these, these, uh, these types of things. Because I feel like companies that do this are, are companies that will be around in the future. So it was, it was very difficult for me to decide to leave this startup. I was very emotionally invested because I was a co-founder and I, I was very emotionally invested in the product and I, I still have enormous respect for all the people that I worked with. I also knew that it wasn't right for, for what I wanted to do. I wanted to really continue learning what I, what I enjoy doing, software engineering, and I felt like I was not in the, in the right environment to, to, to gain and learn from that. So I'd, I'd really urge anybody who, who's, who finds himself in that situation, uh, you know, seek out different things and, and look for, for what really matters to you and um, make that, you know, be willing to make a change even if that means that you're, you're giving up a good opportunity. So, um, those, that's the uh, presentation that I have for you. Any, uh, any questions? Yeah, that's it. You can never know for sure, right? Um, because having the offshore engineering meant that we were saving money and we were getting really good engineers, and that's good. And that's important for a startup because usually what kills startups is they run out of money. Uh, but I think to create a sustainable business and something that is going to continue to grow, I think that you do have to decide some of these things. But some of the things that are, are very important, like deciding what your culture is or deciding what your values are as a company, are free. You, you're not even spending money to do that. Um, so I don't know. I mean, there, there's, there's, no, there's no way of saying. But it, it's definitely interesting you know, to think about. Uh, I had a question. Did the, uh, did the, uh, the other founder ever kind of come around and figure out how to exert some kind of culture, or really it was just sort of drifting? Um, I, I think it was very intentional. I don't think it was seen as a problem. Um, and yeah. So I would say no. <laughs> How did you find Pivotal? Like, did I do, or how did that? Uh, it was a referral from uh, Jenny, Jenny Chu. Yeah. And, and of course, I've, I've heard of Pivotal just being in software engineering, just things like Jasmine and uh, open source projects. So I knew I wanted to work for a company that, that did open source also. Yeah. Do I regret my time at Zoom Data? Uh, no. Not at all. I think that any, I, I don't think it's, if there's one thing I would probably regret not speaking up more about some of these things, but you also don't know it until hindsight sometimes. Or you don't know it until you see another experience that kind of gives you the language to, to uh, express it. Um, so I, I don't regret it, and I would urge anybody in this room to, to go after something like this if they're interested you know, go after some kind of startup. And you live in the Bay Area, you know, so there's a lot of opportunities around. Well, 
what's the thing that really pushed you over the edge? Because it seems like it's like in any of these situations you don't realize what's going on and it's like one thing that's less forgivable in a way. So I'm just curious yeah. how that was for you. Um I I would say probably what it was, was when I canceled a two-week vacation that I had to fly out to Ukraine for an emergency thing to get the team, you know, stabilized or get them to work. Well, not, not get them to work. They were definitely working hard. But, but basically to manage the work, you know, on site. Uh, I started looking at that and thinking, this is, I, I don't want to do this. <laughs> yeah. Is there another question? Cool. Thanks.